Welcome to How to Write Earth-Changing Emails. My name is Becky Wiegand, and I'm a Webinar Program Manager here at TechSoup. I've been with the organization for a little more than six years, and prior to that spent a decade working with small nonprofits in Washington, D.C. and Oakland, California. I was frequently the accidental techie who had to make the technology decisions with very little expertise. So I've been in the situation that many of you join us from today, and hopefully can make this event one that helps you learn how to make good decisions for your technology at your organization. Also joining us as our expert presenter today is Allison Carlman, the Senior Unmarketing Manager at Global Giving. And her job there is she's responsible for telling Global Giving's story and helping the organization understand its social impact. Uh, and she is really in charge of a lot of their email strategy and the work that they do around fundraising. She began her career in the nonprofit communications sector at the Denver Art Museum, lives in Washington, D.C. now, and is joining us from there today. She spent time also in the Western Cape in Africa and South Africa, um, and in Kenya working with organizations like Kiva and Medicine Sans Frontier, or Doctors with Bo Without Borders. So we are very happy to have her joining us today to share her expertise on how she helps the huge range of organizations connected with Global Giving both improve their email campaigns and reach more audience to support their programs. In addition, you'll see Ali Bezdikian on the back end, and she is an interactive events and webinar producer here at TechSoup. And she'll be there in the chat window to flag your questions, help you with any technical issues, and chat out to you throughout the webinar. So if you have suggestions to share, please chat them to her and she can share them with the rest of our audience. A look at today's agenda. I'll do a quick introduction of TechSoup, followed by a couple of polls to get us started on the topic of the day, and help us understand where you are at currently with your email strategy. We'll hear a little bit about Global Giving's secret sauce from Allison, and then she'll take us through three different ways of looking at how to improve and make your emails earth changing. And then she'll talk about her strategy to listen, act, learn, and repeat. We'll have time for Q&A at the end, but there may be opportunities during the webinar to also chime in. So feel free when it moves you to ask those questions in the chat window. So who is TechSoup? We are a 501c3 nonprofit working toward the day when every nonprofit, library, social benefit organization on the planet has the access to technology resources and knowledge to better achieve their mission. We do this in a lot of different ways. Primarily we do it through our donation programs that have connected more than 200,000 charitable organizations with donations from companies like Microsoft, Adobe, Cisco, and Intel in more than 60 countries around the, around the world. And we do this every day, and we are always trying to expand the different product offerings available through our catalog as well as the services we provide like our webinars and events and articles and blog posts. Um, in addition, we are trying to expand to offer more services that can help you make technology decisions like consulting services as well as the latest products like Windows 8.1 and QuickBooks 2014. You can find all of this and more by visiting TechSoup.org. So for those of you who aren't familiar with us, please join us there to learn more. Now on to the topic of the day, how to write earth-changing emails. This isn't a question just to poll you for our benefit. This is a question on screen to help us understand where you are at currently with your email. So what's the size of your current email list? Roundabout. We know these are broad categories, but let us know, are you and this is your list or lists combined. And this helps us get an idea of sort of what your audience reach is and maybe what your capacity is. Gives us a hint into maybe how many staff you might have. And you can feel free to comment in the chat window if you feel like these categories don't capture your organization all that well, or if you have some other thought to share. I'll give just a few more seconds for people to respond. It looks like the great majority have email lists that are either 1,000 or less or 10,000 or less, which is really helpful to know. Um, I'm going to go ahead and look at the results here. And I have people also chiming in in the chat to let us know. So this is great. Thank you for participating. And one more question for you. And so we have one person commenting that it's 
their list is 1,500 or so. So it's not anywhere near 10,000, but it's slightly more than 1,000. So yes, we know our categories don't capture everything, but it's helpful for us to know um, and to guide Allison as our expert in what kind of audience reach you're currently working with um, and what kind of capacity for email you're, you're handling on a daily basis. A couple of other people have commented 2,800, 2,000. So it might have been helpful for me to have another category there in the middle. Uh, one of our commenters asked, not sure what you mean by email list. Is that our contact list or people that we regularly send group emails to? I think that could include both. Um, but I'm really thinking of your bulk email list, so the people that you would send a newsletter to for example. So let's go ahead and look at our next question before I hand it over to Allison to take us through some of her earth changing tips. Um, have you done A-B testing on your emails before? This is a yes, no, and not really sure what it means. And it's totally okay to say that you don't know what it means. That's what this type of event is geared toward, is to make sure that everybody is on the same page and can utilize the tips that Allison brings to us today. Um, and so in doing that, we want to make sure everyone knows what we're talking about. And it looks like quite a few aren't sure. And so maybe one way to start us off is, well, we will be talking about this further into the, into the webinar topic as well. But just a really quick overview or definition of it is A-B testing means taking a segment of your existing list. So say you have 1,000 subscribers, and maybe you take um, 100 of those subscribers, and you divide them into two groups, and you test something in your email. Maybe you test the subject line, or you test uh, some of the content, and you send a batch of that to group A, that 50, and then you send a slightly different email to the other 50, and you see which one performs better. And then whichever one really performs better, then you'd send that one to the bulk remaining part of your list. We'll talk more about that later on, but this is really helpful to get an idea of where our audience is at today. And so we can spend time really defining that later when Allison talks about it in her agenda. So around almost 70% say that they're not sure, and the other 26% are saying that they aren't using it. So this is a great opportunity to talk about how that can be leveraged to help you improve your email. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and invite our speaker, Allison Carlman, Senior Unmarketing Manager at Global Giving, to join us at the line and to take us through her strategy for helping us all achieve earth-changing emails. So thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. You sound great. Great. Well, it's such a pleasure to be here today. It's so exciting to see all these memes popping up. Um, it's really great to get a chance to talk to you, and I'm glad to have a little bit of an idea of, of who I'm speaking with and maybe the size of organizations and um, email strategies that you might have. Um, so I'll just go ahead and get started here. Uh, my, my goal is that in the next hour, now in the next 50 minutes, uh, you will learn the most effective way to motivate your audiences using emails. Um, also, we'll talk about identifying your super friends and what that means. And finally, um, in the next hour, hopefully you will walk away having written a hypothesis for one email experiment that you're going to do. So here we go. Um, I'm from Global Giving. Um, many of you may be familiar with Global Giving already. Um, you may know of us as the world's first and largest global crowdfunding platform for nonprofits. So we work with nonprofits of all shapes and sizes um, all around the world in 157 countries. And then we also have donors of all shapes and sizes, um, mostly individual donors, but a really robust set of more than 100 corporate partners too who also donate to uh, the nonprofit projects on our site. So our work, um, our, our goal is to channel more dollars to more doers every day. Um, but in addition to providing nonprofits with the critical funding that they need, uh, what's exciting is that we can also provide critical information and tools that enable nonprofits to be as effective as possible with the money that they do receive. And because we have some really great incentives um, on our platform and some great bonus dollars and corporate funding, as organizations become more effective, we can provide them with a kind of exposure that assures that the world knows it. And as their effectiveness increases, so does their funding. 
Um, so my shameless plug here is if you're a nonprofit and you're interested in the idea of individual crowdfunding online and working with us, um, you're welcome to um, apply. We, we would love to have you apply to join. And we get organizations on the site through uh, something called an open challenge. And you can learn more about it at the link that I just sent um, where you can learn about our open challenge and the application process. And the deadline is July 24th. So that's the end of my shameless plug. Um, now more back, back to emails and how to write earth-changing emails. So I talked about uh, we have tools that can help organizations become more effective. And you're probably wondering, how do we know what makes an organization effective? And the answer is that we've seen that whether in business, government, or the nonprofit sector, some of the world's most agile and adaptable organizations are ones who do this. They listen, act, learn, and repeat. We call it a cycle of progress, where they're constantly honing what they do based on the best information that they can get their hands on. And we've seen that nonprofits, including ourselves, become more effective when we listen to what our stakeholders are saying, um, including the constituents that we serve, our peers, um, experts who are also talking about the type of work that we're doing. And then once we hear those ideas, we test some of them out with our own target audiences, and we track results and learn from those results, and then try the whole process again. That's the repeat step. So we really believe that this not only helps you become more effective at the work you do in achieving your mission, but it's also a way to uh, help improve your fundraising strategy as well. So we're going to talk about listen, act, learn, repeat today in terms of email marketing and your uh, fundraising strategy over email. So this is it. This is the punchline of this whole presentation, Global Giving Secret Sauce for Writing Earth-Changing Emails. Um, in order to get your audience and your readers to act in the way that you hope. I get people all the time asking me, what's the best practice for email? What's the best time to send emails? Um, what are the best word lengths? Um, and all of that. And the answer, unfortunately, nobody wants to hear this, is always, well, it depends on your audience. Have you tried it? What, is, what, is, what works best with your audience? Because it's not the same for every audience. So. I'm going to start by showing you how we at Global Giving have listened, acted, learned, and repeated with our own emails so that you can then um, get an idea about and be inspired to listen, act, and learn, repeat on your own. And then you'll already be a third of the way through the cycle because you'll have listened to me talking for 30 minutes here. Um, and then you'll be able to develop some ideas about how to act and then prepare to learn from your experiment by tracking, tracking your results. And again, this is a cycle, so there's no real um, beginning or end to it. So we're just going to jump in at this point where I'm going to share with you some of the acting that we've done. Um, and you'll listen on that and be able to act yourself. So here we go. The cycle starts with listening. And we group all of our sources of feedback into three different categories here. The first is users. And users could be anything. Users could be the constituents, the people that you serve. Um, users could be the people that are reading your email. So in this very specific case, we're going to be talking about the users of the emails that you're sending. So these are the people on your email list. Um, and then there's also peers. So peers are, um, you could call them your frenemies, other organizations that are doing similar work to you who are friends um, but also competitors. Um, but I think one of the really most powerful things about the nonprofit sector is that there's so much good to be done in the world and there's so much more potential for more good to happen that um, the world works better when we work together to meet our missions. So we really see um, peer collaboration as a great way to help one another improve the work that we're doing. And the third is theory. There are people who do or get paid to do studies and research about things, and um, it's always great to test out what you read and what other um, experts who are spending a lot of time doing very scientific studies are saying. Okay, so first, the users. Um, we are going to take a look at back through the Wayback Machine of Global Giving's emails. These are some snapshots of emails that we as Global Giving have sent. And uh, we send approximately one to four emails every month to a list of about 140,000, which sounds like it's a lot bigger than the list that you guys are probably working with, but I believe that the principles can still be the same. We're usually asking for donations in our emails um, on behalf of our nonprofit partners who have projects on our site. 
Last year we, we raised uh, just under $300,000 from those emails for our nonprofit partners. And this year we're poised to do even better because we will continue to test, 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 and find out what works with our audiences. So to start out, I'll give you an idea of about five years ago, this is what our email newsletter looked like. Um, the term e-newsletter e is what we use now, but it's kind of a relic because it's actually more descriptive of how our emails used to be. They used to have news. They used to be about us, and they would be little snapshots of news articles where you could click uh, to view the full article. And um, what we found from our users based on the way that they were interacting with our emails and what they were just telling us was that they didn't want to read. Um, I think this has changed a lot just as all of us in the past five to eight years have gotten a lot more email. We don't really want to read. So I think a lot of us are guilty of, of wanting to share so much content in our newsletters, um, but, it, but our experience is that people don't want to read. So. Uh, the, the next feedback we got once we changed the format, this is how we changed it, um, was that it worked really well once we started to humanize it. And instead of talking about ourselves, we started talking about our users. So that's what I mean by show me what it means to me. Um, this email says, Dear Kevin, Kevin is the reader of this email, what are you doing for Black Friday this year? Uh, so this is now about you, the reader, and not us as Global Giving. And that's our next Step, we started to see our emails were performing a lot better when they were not about us. We also started to include some better images and found that people clicked on images. So the next thing we did was we just made a really big image, a big header image. And we also realized that being more focused and making it even shorter was working for us. So more focused and even shorter uh, with big images, that was our next steps in the next way that we iterated. Um, the next bit of user feedback we got was we saw that a lot of people were, we could track where people were clicking on emails, and we saw that they would really click on um, emails or images where people, where there was one person in an image that's looking at you, making eye contact, and looking hopeful. Uh, and so if you look at our, our past newsletters in the past couple years, that's what we do. We feature one person making eye contact, looking hopeful, because people tend to click on that. And, and we've seen that over and over again. Then the next thing we started to do was to continue. Here we have a turtle looking at you, looking hopeful, making eye contact. Um, the next thing we started to do was ma try and make it more clever and unexpected. So here we have a pretty cool image, and then we started to incorporate a lot more humor. This has a bunch. This email has a bunch of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles jokes in it. Um, and we saw that those started to go over really well. And in fact, people were sharing them just because they liked um, the style of the email, not even necessarily because they liked the call to action, but it got the word out there. The next thing we started to do was instead of just writing our call to action in the email in text, we started uh, making it into a button. And then we made it into a larger button, and then larger and larger buttons. And so now we have a pretty embarrassingly large Give a Gift Card button in this email, or it might say Donate Now. Um, we, we realized that the bigger we made the call to action, the more people clicked on it. So that's what we do now. And then finally, the last thing that we learned from our users that I'm going to talk about today um, was personalization. And so some of you who have smaller lists than 1,000, and maybe you're sending out 100 emails or even 20 emails, you might be able to just manually personalize emails, and maybe you already do that a little bit. Um, but if you, if you use a different mail provider, we use MailChimp for example, um, we found a few ways to customize by including the person's first name in it. Um, and in what we actually do in this email here is I'm trying to show how we included the images and projects from the organizations uh, that people had donated to. So they were seeing things that were familiar to them. And so every person that got an email on our list had a different email because it pulled in their own personal um, project information to, to organizations they'd given to. And so you can take this um, tip in a lot of different ways, but the more you can personalize it and make it hyper relevant to the person receiving it, the better. So that's my quick and dirty uh, 
uh, list of the things that we've learned over the past few years that we try and implement with every email that we're sending. Here's a summary of it. Keep it short and focused. Make it about the users, not you. No, really, make it even shorter. Use big, compelling images. Um, often the best images are one person making eye contact. Use humor and do things that are unexpected. Feature a very clear call to action, and personalize. So that was from the users. Those were things that we were learning from the users. The next thing I want to talk about is peers and what we can learn from our peers. And so I'll tell you a little bit about who we consider our peers are. We have a small group of folks who work on online communications in a group of similar organizations uh, that all met up a few years ago um, and started just sharing what we were learning. And we call each other the super friends, or at least that's what global giving people call the rest of the group is the super friends. Um, for us, it's Kiva, DonorsChoose.org, and Charity Water, similar organizations. And we get on a, a call a couple times a year to talk about, hey, what are you testing and what are you learning so we can share those best practices because we think we probably have a lot of the same uh, donor base. Um, it's a pretty bold thing to um, ask out, to reach out to people who might be considered competitors. But again, we've all really thrived from this relationship and we feel like we're just improving the sector and advancing our, our missions, each one of us, um, and it's been really cool. So I um, would really encourage you to think about who your super friends are. So, oh, so what, I, what I'm about to show you is three emails. I asked each of our super friends to share their best performing email from 2013. So I'm going to show you one from Kivo, one from Donors Choose, and one from Charity Water. And I'm actually going to ask you to start engaging here and start typing in your chat what you think makes that email really compelling. What made that the best performing email of the year? So here we go. Here is Charity Water's email. I'm going to take you sec give you a second to read it. And as you're reading, you can start typing into the chat to uh, tell us why you think it was their best performing email. So it looks like some of the comments coming in, some people are suggesting story says little text. Christy suggests it's a pic of a family. Kimberly says the picture. Um, story suggests that it's a big picture of people smiling. There's a big button. Positive image, family facing forward. Makes me curious from Cynthia. That was my response when I first saw this one. Was what does the ha huh mean? What is the answer? Uh, inspires curiosity, family atmosphere. They're smiling, eye contact, great picture, consistent color theme. People want to know the answer. Good humor, asks a question, visually very appealing, hopeful, little amount of text. Uh, it asks, somebody asks, what's the subject line of the email? We can't see that in here. I don't know if you know what that is. Um, I don't know another what that person is said, either. It's ex unexpected. You do know what that is or you don't? Sorry. I don't, no. Okay. That's okay. Um, it's zeroed in on water, talks about giving, assuming most people want to give. And somebody says, it's the huh. It's a button. I love it. Really creative. So tell us, are all of our participants chiming in? Are they correct? <laughs> I think I think you all nailed it, and I don't actually know what um, the the perfect answer is, but I think we can all guess. Um, and th this is a list of things um, that you know Charity Water also said why they think it worked out well. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Here is the subject line: "Tis the season for a box full of sand." And uh, and, and we think it was really excellent because it's a beautiful image. It's well laid out. It's formatted for mobile phones. I don't know if you could tell that, but if you look at the size of the image, it's perfect for an iPhone. And um, there is, you're right, there's very little text. You can read it really quickly. And everybody loves that button at the bottom that says, huh? Um, everybody would probably just click it because you're like curious, what are you going to tell me? I, even if you didn't read the text above it. So. Um, those are things that they had narrowed it down and iterated to to come up with a really powerful email. 
And you can't keep us okay. in suspense, so we need to answer what the ha huh is too, because that was my <laughs> question when we first looked yeah, at and it. Then, <laughs> then the ha huh talks about, a, a, I believe it's like a biodigester um, that they're helping families with in, in Cambodia. Um, so that's why they're, that's what they're trying to talk to people about. So if you think that your nonprofit does work that's not very sexy, here's a great job of talking about a not very sexy topic in a pretty sexy email. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And so, one of our participants comments that their friend's daughter just got back from Cambodia doing exactly this work. So a little connection there. That's great. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, so then here's the next one. Um, this is from DonorsChoose.org, and the subject line was Urgent Classroom Request. So again, chime in in our chat and let us know what you think made this successful. I'll be reading off your answers. Max comments that it's personalized, hopeful kids, large link. Stacy comments, very specific request. Vicki, happy smiling kids. Susanna, hopeful little faces, personalization. Um, Cynthia says, I honestly probably wouldn't even finish reading it, so maybe she's not a fan of this one. Um, little children smiling, lots of happy kids, that it's a specific ask, has a cute homemade card, uh, gives the opportunity, a personal response, colored text, uh, donation goes to someone and it's not abstract. So those are some of the, the feedback that our audience is sharing. Yep, that's all really excellent. Um, here's what Donors Choose told me that they think made this most uh, successful, was uh, that it was personalized by state. So um, you can see here, um, they said, our littlest learners in New York could use some holiday cheer. So wherever Morgan was from, it was in New York is where sh her um, database information was. So this was personalized to the state of every recipient. Um, and then also, it was simple and brief, although you're right, it's possible people might not even get all the way through there. Uh, but but it really is only you know, three sentences and um, two sign-offs. So I think it, that was also really effective. And then urgent. So this is one thing that's really interesting. They said urgent classroom request, um, which is a very specific thing. But since this was mass sent to every person on their list, it wasn't about any specific classroom that really needed one thing. Um, just using the word urgent, um, and made it actually feel urgent for people. So they didn't even have to, to get into what was urgent about it, um, that it, it still created a sense of urgency and people gave. So that's something that you can think about, is how can you create a sense of urgency and sense of timeliness around uh, an email that you're sending, even if there is no real deadline? Um, you could sometimes just say, we have a goal of raising $500 this week, and that enough could be enough to motivate people to help you get to that goal, um, even if there's no real reason for that. That's okay, great. And so one, one thing more. that I think is interesting about this, just to comment on it quickly, one of our participants was saying that they didn't like it as much. And I, I agree. I think visually it's certainly not as pretty as the last one we looked at. But it's a great example of how you don't necessarily need to have the fanciest graphics or the most awesome uh, system to be able to make a really effective email. It matters, your text matters a lot, and personalization. So these kind of tips can work for anybody, no matter if you're just using your Gmail or you know, a, a regular email tool, not a blast email tool to send out emails. So just yes, thought I'd I chime totally that in there. I totally agree. And that's what's really interesting about what I'm learning these days in emails is I think we all like to think that you know, really beautiful images like this are always going to be the most effective. But you'll see with the next example, um, lower tech actually ended up working better. Um, what's most important is that you test with your audience and you see what version, um, what really gets people to move. Because ultimately you're trying to get results out of your email. Um, and we all think that everyone loves really powerfully written stories and really beautiful imagery, but sometimes short and brief and um, punchy is what works. So here's um, Kiva's example of what was the most powerful email um, of 2013. And this one I'm going to have to kind of give you the punchline because it's kind of confusing. So you can see at the bottom half of this email there is um, 
or just the regular e-newsletter. And you can see it says, hi, first name. Um, you can see that's where they would have used their data system to Im Im import the person's first name. But then they added this chunk of text on the top of it that said, it looks like you haven't used your Kiva balance to make a loan. Please don't let your money sit idle in your account. Thanks for everything you do to support borrowers around the world. Best wishes, Chelsea Bocci, who is the Senior Director of Community. So what it looks like is that this woman herself, Chelsea, has forwarded this personally. She's like, hey, you didn't read the email we just sent you, so I'm making sure you saw it. And, but they did this um, to everyone. So everyone on their list got this version. And it was outstandingly, perf like one of the, it was the best performer of the year um, because it was this one kind of interesting trick that wasn't super high tech. Um, they just added this bit of what looked like personalization up at the top. So here I'll summarize. Um, it was personalized. It made it look like it was forwarded by a staff member. So here less formatting was more effective. However, in my opinion, this might be a one-trick pony. So it's something that you could maybe do once or twice a year. Um, but if you started doing that all the time, your audience might either get tired of it or sort of like realize what you're doing. So um, just uh, I think it's a great example of how trying new and out-of-the-box things um, can be really effective, and it's maybe worth doing sometimes if, it's, if you think it might work with your audience. Um, but it's not necessarily going to be the thing that you now start doing every time. That one's really okay. interesting, I think. <laughs> I do too. Um, so here I'll just summarize again. This is what I learned from my peers. Okay. So I want to ask you who your super friends are, um, who your peers are. We talked about it a little bit earlier, but I'd love for you to just spend 30 seconds thinking about who could you um, ask next week when you're writing an email to go to your supporters? Um, who could you gut check it by? Somebody outside of your organization that already does this um, who might be able to just say, oh, you know, we learned a long time ago that shorter subject lines work better with our audience. Some ways that you could find these people if you can't think of them would be Facebook groups. Right now I'm on a Facebook group called DC Social Media, and people post requests all the time, and hey, have you ever tried this, or does anyone know what this is? Um, another thing would be conferences like um, N10, the Nonprofit Technology Network Conference, um, or Social Media for Nonprofits conferences come through lots of cities in the U.S. and all over the world actually. Um, LinkedIn groups are a really great way to find a, you know, a community of practice uh, around the, the subject that you work on and find people who work in communications or marketing at those organizations. And then if you can't think of anything, what I've done is I've just even created just my own Google group or Yahoo group with four people that I know that all work in marketing at our peer organizations. And we just email the group, you know, if we have a question about something yesterday I saw was like a question about how something works on a Facebook wall, um, that the group of four people all knows each other and we can all respond and learn from one another. Um, yeah, and, and then Becky here also said the Net Squared local group in your area. There's a ton of resources. I know it takes time to sort of foster those connections and ask, but you probably already have some of those people. Um, you just might not be thinking of them as a resource to help you improve the next email that you're going to write. So think of your super friends. Okay, and the last thing I'm going to talk about is theory. So people who are doing academic or other research um, on the topic of what makes people give um, are a great way that we could start to get some ideas of, of tests we could do. There are two studies that I want to just highlight today. Uh, one is this book called The Science of Giving. Experimental Approaches to the Study of Charity. It's a pretty great uh, book that's just a combination of research on different topics about what makes people give. And then the second is More Money for More Good. It's the second in, in a series of two studies by the Markets for Good group um, about what um, nonprofits in U the U.S. say about uh, their donors' behavior. And I'm going to summarize some of their learnings here. So the first thing that uh, these studies say is that if you increase a donor's emo emotional proximity to your subject, they will give more. 
um, or in English speak, um, if you connect the donor to one person, one animal, one object, one story, um, then they'll be more likely to care about that. It's easier for people to connect to one person than it is to connect to a group of people. The next thing is now once you've connected them to one person, tell a compelling story about how that person has grown or changed or succeeded because of your help or how they've gotten to where they're, they're going or need to get somewhere else and, and need the interaction of the donor. So if you can tell a compelling story, that's really helpful. Third, donors will give if they feel it will bring them closer to people in their own network. I think this one is fascinating. So it turns out, according to this research, that people give often because it elevates their own position among their own friends and network. So you know, if you think about it, if you ever share things on Facebook as a person, just with your own personal page, um, you often probably share things that you think your friends will benefit from. So maybe it's a funny video, or it's an inspirational quote, and you like the feeling that you're the one that brought them that bit of content and they sort of associate you with that content. Or maybe you're always sharing news and facts and you like being seen as an expert in some sort of field. All of our donors are the same, and they want to somehow feel more connected to people in their own network, um, and so sometimes that's why they give. And so it might even be like, well, I have a friend who, you know, my, my friend was just in Cambodia doing that similar work, so I, I feel connected to that, so I will give. So that's something to be thinking about. Um, and then four, of course, people give more when it's easy. So sometimes they are maybe motivated by your email, but they're going to um, get tired and move on if it's too many clicks or uh, too much to do once they've gotten into the process of giving. So make sure that whatever you're using, wherever you're directing people to give is an easy process. And then finally, unfortunately, not all donors are the same. Some people really do want to do all the research to make sure that you are um, a trusted source that will keep their credit card information safe and use the money as you've said you would. And other people are really just moved by a compelling image or story, and they don't care who you are, they will give because they want to just immediately feel better about the fact that they've helped solve some problem in the world. So that's why, unfortunately, I wish I could tell you just what works for everyone, but I'm just giving you lists of things that organizations, including ourselves, have found that worked for our audiences, and, it, and you now have to figure out what works for your audiences. So that brings me to um, the next part that's going to be even a little bit more interactive. Um, now that you've heard and listened to what your users and your peers and what research researchers have to say, um, then you get to test it out yourself and figure out what works for your audience. And so the big question then is, how do we know what works for our audience? What do we even measure to know what's working? And there are three things that you can kind of test when you're sending emails to see what's working for you. Um, the first thing is the subject line. And so often that's just the last thing people think of after they've crafted a beautiful email, and then they're like, oh yeah, I've got to put a title on it, a subject line, and send it off. And your, your subject line is the most important thing because if people don't like the subject line or if it's not compelling, they won't even open their email so they'll never see your beautiful image and they'll never read your compelling text and call to action. So we test subject lines with what we call open rates, what percentage of your audience, your, your email recipients are opening your emails. If you're sending an email through any sort of third, third party provider, um, they will be able to tell you your open rates. So I use MailChimp. I know that they have some free services available. Uh, for for um, Just anyone actually can use their free version, and I think that's a great way, but most any third-party provider will, will provide you open rates for your emails. Next, does the email content make people want to do more? Does it make people want to click and follow the call to action? And that we just measure by click rates, how, how many people are clicking on your emails. Email providers like MailChimp, again, will tell you that. Also, Bitly is a link shortening service where you can um, type in your website URL and it will give you another version of that link that you post as a hyperlink in your email and then you can track through bitly.com um, or, or bit.ly uh, how your link is performing and how many people are clicking on it. 
Last, does the content of your email and the landing page, so the next thing that they get to after they click on your email, make people act? So are you asking people to um, donate? Are you asking people to sign up for a petition on a petition or an email? Uh, that's your conversions. That's your goals, and you want people to convert on your goals. Uh, so how, how, what is your conversion rate for the email? It, ultimately, is it getting people to do what you want it to do? Again, email providers will help you figure that out. Google Analytics can work uh, in some ways to help you figure that out. And um, you know, if all of this sounds like way too much for you, um, Global Giving actually does offer this, all these um, open rates, click rates, and conversion rates for your email um, so that you can track through emails that you're sending to your donors through Global Giving. Okay, so now that you've, you're thinking about the three ways, the three metrics that we use to test email, um, I'm going to get a little bit into an A-B test, and I'll give you an example of one that we've done. So this is the, the poll that you took earlier. Uh, you had the choice to say whether you've run an A-B test and whether or not you would heard of it before. And an A-B test is very similar. Think back to um, fifth grade when you learned about the scientific method. Um, it's really just doing a science experiment with your, um, your web content. So here, this, if you look at this bar as the entire list of people that you're sending email to, when we do an A-B test, we take the first 20% of the group and we divide that in half to group A and group B. And you can see that um, those two people, we, or the people in that group, that 20%, are who we'll send the test email to. And we'll send two different versions, A and B, to that 20%, and we'll see which one performs better, A or B. And then the winning email, we will then send to the rest of the group. So that's, um, that's the secret behind the Obama campaign and all of their email glory is test, test, test uh, with a segment first and then send the winning, to, winning one to the rest of the audience. So here is an example of an A-B test that we did. Um, and I see someone here ask, uh, how long do you wait after sending the initial test? Um, it depends on the size of your list because you want to make sure that your results are statistically significant or um, at least give you significant results. So um, in some cases, if the size of your list is big enough, maybe an hour will be enough time to see a, a difference in the results. Um, sometimes people do it a day before. It really just depends. Okay, so what I'd love for you to do is um, see these two versions of these emails that we sent. And what, what we did when we sent this email is we had a hypothesis that we were testing. Um, and I'd love for you to type in what you think our hypothesis was for this test. So Jennifer has highlighted what the difference was. Do you want me to call that out? A couple of people yeah. are, have caught on to what it is. So it's really highlighting whether or not having a price tag on those three different items down in the lower portion of the email. So in A, you see the price is listed. B, you don't. And that is the big difference. Um, so a lot of people have caught on to that and, and were chatting in. So in order to gauge which you think did better, we want to have a little poll again. So go ahead and tell us, do you think that version A with the prices listed performed better than version B? Go ahead and click which one you think. Whether and the prices a little bit of Go ahead, give the sorry, background. A little sure. bit of background. This was a Father's Day email we sent where we were promoting these custom Lego sets. Um, where the Legos were free gifts with donations to projects on global giving of a certain amount. So yes, you got it right that there's a price, the price tag or no price tag. Um, price tag was A, no price tag was B. So let's give a few more seconds for people to weigh in and let us know, do you think that A or B did better with the price tags in A or without the price tags in B? And I'm going to go ahead and skip to the results. It looks like the majority by far, almost 78%, thought that A did better with the price tags and that the prices made a difference in getting people to click through. So tell us, Allison, is our audience All correct? All right. So our hypothesis for this email 
was that if we didn't list the price, the required donation amount, then more people would click through to the main page uh, where then they could learn more about the Legos. And how did it go? Version A got 80 clicks. Version B, without prices, got 175 clicks. Dun, dun, so, dun. Um, <laughs> while Our it, audience it seems, is wrong. I know. So it, it turns out that people actually um, made their decision when they saw the price and they moved on. Um, but they were maybe more engaged and clicked on the email and were willing to read more about it um, and, uh, and, and see more there. And I see someone here typed in the question, what was the conversion though? Because you can see I'm, I didn't, I'm not tracking opens because I had the same subject line for this rate for both versions, so that wasn't a significant factor. And then the conversions or the donations, and that is the great question. I'm so glad you're asking because that's the most important thing. And uh, we actually did find that the, the version B was um, converted better as well. But uh, yeah, I didn't put that in there because I wanted to focus here on just the click rates. Um, that's what we were looking at. But this is really important and why it's, it's really valuable to do that testing because a lot of us, myself included, when we first went through this in our practice run, uh, assumed that A would have done better, that the more obvious it is that people know what they are getting into and they know the cost of the service that they might be providing up front. And it turns out that it was just not as – it didn't perform as well. So that's really, I think, helpful, uh, you know, a good reconfirmation of the need to test. Great. Okay, so then now we're going to um, – it's time for you as um, the people listening to this webinar to design your own email experiment. So I've demonstrated how we've listened to our users, to our peers, and to experts, um, and how we acted, learned, and repeated. So I would love for you to start an experiment. So start thinking about uh, what your hypothesis could be. Um, I want you to answer in the chat. I believe that trying blank will lead to higher blank. And, and the second one will either be higher open rates, higher click rates, or higher donations. And as you're thinking about it, I will summarize some of the ideas that you heard earlier so you can think, what, think about them. These are some of the things I heard from users, peers, and theory. And then also here are the ways that you can test it. So you have to make sure that the metric you're looking at is related to the content that you're testing. So a couple of people have chimed in in the chat saying, so Jennifer says um, that I believe that trying shorter program descriptions will lead to higher click rates. Um, let's see, uh, Joyce says that she could test, I believe that trying larger Donate Now button will lead to more clicks. Uh, so we have people doing it live in the chat which is great because this is the experiment that we want you to be able to go back and do with your own email list. Uh, Susanna comments, I believe trying listening will lead to higher donations. Uh, well. Which is great on a meta level, but I'd love for you also to think about what's one specific thing that you could try. So you listen during this webinar. You've now committed 40 minutes to listening. Um, what, what is one thing that you could do to act? So Malia says, I believe that a hashtag in the subject line will lead to higher open rates. So that's interesting, an interesting idea to test out. Monica says, I believe that trying to tell a more compelling story about one person will lead to higher donations. So that would be testing your conversions. Great. So lots of, lots of ideas coming in of ways people could test this. I believe that positive imagery with shorter words 
and a meaningful purpose will lead to increased donations. Now the one thing with that is that it's really two or three different things in there. So you may want to call out and test one of those things at a time. Uh, is that the best practice, Allison, to try and test one area in each Yeah, absolutely. Test? Because um, it may turn out that your um, they love your pictures and they love the, um, the descriptions that you have. Um, or let's say maybe they love the pictures, but they hate the descriptions. And so the results don't change, and you won't know why. So if you ch first test changing the images um, and see what the results are, and then you test changing the content and, and the descriptions and see what the results are, then you'll be able to pinpoint what's made it successful. Exactly. If you test too much at once, then you really don't know uh, what brought you that result necessarily. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. So a lot of good ideas coming in. Well, I would, I would encourage you to continue to think be thinking, and don't let this hour end without thinking about one thing that you're going to do to test, to do a test in your email. Um, the, the last part of this listen, act, learn, repeat cycle is the repeat, um, the point that you have to keep doing it all the time. Um, so you make sure that you know, what you learned before, um, it may not even still work five years ago because people change and your audience probably changes, not the same people are on your list. So just you have to keep repeating this cycle, listening, acting, learning, and repeating. So the last uh, thing, I just wanted to go back to the goals that we had for this webinar. I wanted you to think about and to learn the most effective way to motivate your audiences, and that is to lear learn what works for them. And you do that by listening, acting, learning, and repeating. Also to help you think about identifying your super friends. Um, probably the, the very easiest way you could do this without having to talk to anybody would be just Sign up for a bunch of emails from organizations that you know that are sort of your friends and competitors and see how, what they do. Although I, I would warn you, you don't know how well they're performing. So just because they're trying something doesn't mean they're succeeding at it. So maybe sign up for them, find a cool um, thing that they're doing, and then just email the person who wrote it um, and the person in charge of communications there and be like, that was such a great email. How did it work for you to see if it worked or not? And then, um, and then, like I said, I would love for you to walk away with a hypothesis. Um, and I want to close with one really quick story here. Um, there's an organization. I had a friend who worked for an organization that helps um, people who are blind get paired with dogs, uh, with with service dogs. And the organization had been around for a long time, and they'd found that after a while that people really started to connect and respond more to stories about dogs and about how they were training the dogs and finding the dogs um, than the other stories that they were telling. So they started using more and more pictures of puppies and great dogs, and it was just super compelling. And, um, and it was going really well. But it started to sort of change the environment in their office, and it turned out that um, less people who were blind were still on staff and even on the board. And they finally found themselves in a place where the organization over a couple of years had shifted to really be about dogs and, and a lot less about the blind people that the dogs were ultimately intending to serve. Um, and so I tell you that just to remind you that you know, we all every day would love to have like, the best practice in, and be doing really great emails and just really compelling people to give. But if it's not serving the mission and if it's not serving the dignity of the people that you um, intend to serve, then um, when the, we're, some, we're doing something wrong. So you always have to keep in mind, is, is this tactic that I'm trying really going to um, bring dignity to the people that I'm intending to serve? Great, great story. I love it. And I always love a picture of a dog <laughs> in any presentation or a cat. I'm a lover of both. Well, with that, I'd like to go ahead and get us started with questions. Thank you so much, Allison, for the excellent presentation. Feel free to put your questions in the chat. We have just a few minutes to try and get through some. And if we don't get to all of your questions today, you can feel free to ask them in our community forums where we'll continue answering them there. Um, so Michelle asks, I think a really valuable question um, up in the front end. She was asking about how do you incorporate humor when the subject that your agency is dealing with is something really hard like suicide? And I can imagine this applies to organizations that work with domestic violence or 
sex trafficking or child neglect and abuse or any, any number of topics that are really hard topics. Do you have any ideas or suggestions of how somebody could incorporate humor or, or make an email kind of fun, like have the little turtle like what we showed in the example? Yeah, that's a great question because I, I hear that all the time too. People are like, well, we just don't work with animals. And animal pictures might work, but they don't work for us. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with helping to find your organization's voice and the voices of the people who work for your organization. So while the topic of suicide is so heavy, um, I'm guessing that not all the emails that you write are very specifically telling the story of a family who's, you know, sort of, survived um, a suicide in their family. Um, you might also be writing about um, you know, matching campaigns that are happening or things that are a little bit less heavy. And you can do those things from the voices of the people who work at the organization. And, and they're allowed to have a little bit more um, you know, the lighter tone and a more of a sort of human and less organizational tone in the things that they write. And everybody understands that they're people too. So I, I think it's a matter of um, honing your voice so that it's always respectful. And so maybe none of your emails are ever going to be funny or have like a super witty or punny um, headline or subject line. But I think you can also um, have a little bit of grace uh, with just the words that you're using um, if they're coming from people and not necessarily signed always just the name of your organization. That's great. Good advice. Um, we have some other questions asking, you know, how are open emails determined and how do you do A-B tests? And you know, that's not so much a question for you, Allison, as much as it is a, a note to myself that I'll be sure to include some resources uh, for e bulk email lists. Um, and none of them are ones that we have in-house. These are all comparison conversations and articles that we've done research on to help you find a tool that might work for you if you need one. Um, most of those kind of features like A-B tests and looking at click-through rates or conversion rates are something that's built into your email tool um, or into your Google Analytics or connected with them. So uh, we'll send some resources out after to make sure that you have some options if you think you may want to move to that. Uh, another question for you though before we wrap up here is Nicole asks, how do we develop a larger email list? How do you grow that list, not just serve the people that are currently on it? Yeah, that's a really good question, and I think it's one we're all trying to figure out. Um, it, I think it has to do with um, just connecting the people that you know, like if you have events, making sure you have somebody helping sign people up at events. If you have other forms that people fill out at any process, um, if you um, are taking donations, are you collecting and, and asking people if they want to be on their, your email list there? Um, it's, it is a really hard thing to do, and I think probably the best thing to do would be just to Google that question and see what other nonprofit resources like N10 or Beth Cantor on, on Beth Cantor's blog are, are saying about how do you grow your email list. Unfortunately, that could probably be a whole other webinar and one I'd love to sit in on and probably not teach. <laughs> well, we are at the top of the hour, so I'm going to quickly just go ahead and show a couple of resources that will be shared with you in that follow-up email you'll receive in a little while. Um, we have some articles already pulled out for you in some forum conversations uh, that discuss broadcast email tools, uh, how you can make those emails more mobile friendly for those of you who ask questions about mobile, um, some email tactics to employ, uh, how to make the most of your email signatures and the emails you're sending already, and bulk email software for very small nonprofits. So we'll include that in our follow-up email later today. Additionally, I'd like you to invite or I'd like to invite you to attend our upcoming webinars, which would include next week's on looking at the sharing economy, organizations and companies like Kickstarter, Uber, and Airbnb, and what the impact and, and capacity is for nonprofits to join that kind of uh, economy with the sharing model. So particularly if you're a library or an organization that has a sharing model already, this would be an interesting event for you to attend. And then we also have another event coming up for libraries on implementing adult library programs with mobile. And then at the end of the month for those of you who want to learn more about your website and how to improve it, we have a webinar with some experts on how to captivate and engage your constituents. So we hope you'll join us for those. Thank you so much again, Allison, for your participation today. I'd also like to it thank 
Yeah, thank you so much. It was really great. And I'd like to thank Ali on the back end for helping field all those questions. Lastly, thank you to our webinar sponsor ReadyTalk for the use of their platform. They make it available to us so we can provide these on a regular basis. Please take a moment when you leave this window to complete the post-event survey to let us know how we did today and how we can continue to improve our webinar programming. Thank you so much everyone, and have a terrific day. Bye-bye.